Hello, listeners and viewers of Politically High Tech. You're encountering this message because this interview will be split at least into two parts. Listen, watch, and enjoy. Welcome everyone to Politically High Tech with your host, Eli. This episode here is going to be quite an interesting one. Very, very interesting. The last type of episode we, we had with this was so about Satemics. It was a very, very humanistic system. Now we go the opposite of that. We're going beyond that. Right, it's a nice human system. There's always one key thing is missing. Yeah, I'm kind of talking bad about the previous guy. It's missing the great G-O-D spell dog backwards. Yeah, that's what we're missing, right? You know, it's a good opening act, but that opening act don't have that spunk, that final ingredient that's going to put it all together. Will this act do so? We'll see. I'm not the type I make. I don't make problems. I don't believe in that. I'm sure if I make one, I'll find a way to break it immediately. So <laughs> I'm not going to make it. Before I ramble, let's get into godly stuff. Yes, I said it. If you're an atheist, if you're getting pissed off, if you're going to be all agitated, go right ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. Go right ahead. Get angry. Get angry. Oh, these people believe in this godly goop thing called God. Well, guess what? Your life would be better. I'll give it a shot. But, you know, it's smarter than me, right? <laughs> if you can attack my sarcasm. Um, anyways, before I attack my potential atheist listeners you now you can feel free to get out of here if you can't handle it but if you're brave relax. you might learn a thing or two you might i have a guest here who definitely part of the church and he's gonna even refresh me on some things about great kingdom of god and let me just warn you if you're gonna be a, a man child about it it's gonna be controversial i mean i had a guest here i had a couple of guests i talked about the confederate how do i agree with all of it but i let them have the right to talk about it i'm exposing you to different points that's my job at the end i want to play cancel culture i want to cancel they get um brother gregory williams oh he's evil he's a devil he's hurting my feelings no get him out because he believes in god you know what i don't need you to be honest i don't come back to me when you're ready to receive um at, at least some words of God, okay? And I might even expect you to be completely open. You could be skeptic. I'm a skeptic by nature, okay? I, I get it. I have a natu natural, I have a skeptical mind. That's why I get for being born in a big apple. You don't believe in things easily because there's so much hustling, so much conning. Forget forget about the internet ad. There are people ads too, selling you a bunch of not they ain't selling you the good stuff. I ain't gonna say God's a seller. I think that's that's that you told me that I now that I'll be for he ain't he's not a seller. A seller gotta con you. God's not a seller. He's ready to accept you when you're ready. Okay. A seller just needs your money. So let me introduce him. He's been very patient and I've been rambling already. His name's brother Gregory Williams. He is gonna tell you about the kingdom of God and so much more because we flawed human heathens need to hear this sometimes i call myself heathen i don't i don't always do christian okay that's just me but we need to hear it we need to hear it. sometimes not what we want to hear is what we need to hear to grow exponential okay so take it away introduce yourself to my audience i might be offended or enlightened depending on <laughs> well yeah i'm I'm I one of the first uh, podcast interviews that I did with somebody who was an atheist who kind of uh, was supposedly I guess there were he has a lot of guests that don't know that he's an atheist. He likes to invite people, you know, uh, to talk about the Bible, but he doesn't tell them that he's an atheist. I I looked him up, listened to his podcast, saw he was an atheist. Fine, I get along well with atheists. The people that get the most angry at me are the Christians. <laughs> so so that, that may give everybody a heads up. If you're an atheist, you might want to listen to what I got to tell you. <laughs> but if you're a Christian, well, we'll just have to find out. But yeah, I, I'm actually a sheep herder out in the desert. And uh, I was out uh, wrestling calves this morning, uh, sheep, uh, uh, walking through gra fields of grain that are going to be cut in a few days or a week or so. And uh, so I do all that hands-on stuff. But then, like I said, just before this podcast, I was going through translations of Josephus, who was a historian at the time of Christ. So there was this thing they talk about, you know, you talk about the Bible. What's the Bible about? People say, well, that's about religion. Well, it only mentions religion five times in the Bible. It re it mentions government 700, 800 times in the Bible. So is it about religion or is it about government? I don't know. You tell me. Uh, the uh, phrase we get from uh, Abraham Lincoln, 
Gettysburg Address. Uh, he talks about the government of the people, for the people, and by the people. That's supposed to be us, right? Where'd he get that phrase? He got that from the Bible. He got it from the introduction to the Wycliffe Bible. That Wycliffe said, this is the book for the government of the people, for the people, and by them. And so what is... The problem is, just like we've seen recently, a lot of science has been hijacked for political purposes or scientific terms have been hijacked. Well, there's been a lot of religious terms over the years that have been hijacked in order to get more power over you. Christ didn't come to get more power over you. He came to empower you. Moses came to set you free from bondage of Egypt. What was the bondage of Egypt? 20% of your labor belonged to the government. And Moses wanted to set you free from that. Uh, how did the government of Israel work in the original? You know, if we go back three, four thousand years ago, the government of Israel operated entirely by free will offering. There was no taxation, yet they defeated everybody. In Josephus, uh, Aristotle is talking about the philosophy of Israel and how it, they admired it. They thought they had greater philosophers in Israel than they did in Greece. This is Aristotle saying this. So I don't think that's the case uh, until... When we look at Israel at the time of Jesus, unless you count Jesus as a philosopher, and of course he had a lot of ideas that he was sharing with people, but people don't understand what he says. So I have a background in Greek and Latin, Hebrew languages, and 30 years ago, actually almost 40 years ago, uh, I, I looked out the world and I thought things were going bad then with the government. And rights seemed to be disappearing and uh, there were abuses uh, by government of people and I couldn't make sense out of it. I, I was thinking like something's wrong. Something We're missing something. We're not getting something. And uh, I actually knelt down on the desert and asked. Well, actually, I, I, I proclaimed. I couldn't figure it out. Well, the next day, law books showed up on my doorstep. People came from as far away as Malaysia out here to the desert. We're way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, lawyers, policemen, uh, you know, and since then, I've met all kinds of people from, you know, Tom, uh, Richard Mack uh, and uh, other people that, uh, you know, I've been to Washington, D.C. several times, talked to different people there, presented. I've written five books and they're all free online. You can download them for free online at our websites, hisholychurch.org. You can find out more about them at preparingyou.com. That's another one of our websites. We've got quite a few. I don't run them all. But what we're doing is telling you what, how Christ set people free. What the Christians were really doing. Because if you want your rights back, you're going to have to take your responsibilities back. And that's what Moses was doing in the desert. That's what Christ was doing with the people. That's what the early church was doing. All their social welfare for Christians didn't come from the government of the world. Like Rome. Rome had free bread. They had uh, welfare. Uh, they didn't just get free bread. Free bread is a metaphor. I mean, they gave cheese, bread, money, wine, meat. All these things came from the government when the people were hungry. That's how they went into bondage in Egypt. They didn't have provisions during a famine. They didn't have those provisions because they had cast their own brother into slavery. Had they not cast Joseph into slavery, he would have told them there was a famine coming and they could have prepared. But they they threw their own brother into slavery and then they found themselves in slavery. And they even tell you that in the Bible. I've never heard anybody ever quote it. Reuben tells you why they were going into this bondage of Egypt where 20% of their labor would belong to the government and uh, only they could only keep 80% for themselves. And that was the bondage of Egypt. Today, you go to every country and taxes are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% in some countries of what you produce is going to go to the government. Of course, they're going to give you free bread. They're going to give you welfare. They're going to take care of you. They're give you Medicare, Medicaid. You know, in Rome, Shortly after Christ, they tried universal health care, and it, it only lasted about an emperor. Shortly after they tried that, they were so bankrupt that there were periods of time there where they were changing emperors about every month because the, the government was so corrupt. corrupt. Of course, they had tried different emperors to drain the swamp like we're doing now. You know, that's, that's it was an interesting thing. I, when I was... I was in the seminary studying Latin when I was 13 years old, and I looked up the word emperor. I still have the dictionary, uh, Collins Latin Dictionary. 
look up the word emperor, the definition is commander in chief. Uh, we have an article up, Rome versus us. We show the parallels between the United States government as it is today and as it was at the time of Jesus Christ. They had a system of Corbin in Rome. They had a system of Corbin in Judea. But Je Jesus said Corbin of the Pharisees was making the word of God to none effect. Well, Moses started Corbin way back then in Leviticus. He just said that your Corbin, which means sacrifice in Hebrew, Corbanos in the Latin, it, it's your sacrifice. The sacrifice of the Hebrews were making the word of God to none effect. But the Moses started that sacrifice. So what was different between theirs and what Moses did? Well, Moses says in Leviticus 1, it has to be a free will offering. No taxes. Everybody is expected to tithe. But if you don't tithe, you don't get arrested. You don't get thrown in jail. You don't get fined. You may be excluded from welfare because we know you didn't tithe. Because every 10 families picked a minister. And that minister, that Levite minister, that shepherd of the people. He was supposed to serve the tabernacles of the congregation. I was just talking to some people in Texas uh, the other day and pointing out, you know, that the, the Levites, they were health, education, and welfare. They were the Army Corps of Engineers. They knew how to build stuff. And that was one of the things Israel knew how to build stuff. They knew how to make all kinds of things. I don't think we know how much technology they did have back then. And um, because we have kind of, somebody has drawn a picture of what Israel was doing originally. And we have followed that picture today. What I'm going back and showing you what they were really doing. You know, it's one of our contentions that their altars of clay and stone weren't piles of rocks and piles of dirt. They weren't killing sheep and burning them up. Now, that, that's a controversial statement amongst Jews, Christians, even Muslims. Uh, but we show what those words actually mean. Using their dictionaries, their concordances. You know, if if I wrote new ones, then you could say, oh, that's just me. I take their own words and show them what they were actually doing. And that shakes people up. So the problem today, I heard your uh, podcast with a guy, Peter, I can't remember his last name, but he was on the Constitution, had been a mailman and became a... Oh, uh, Seraphine, yeah. Seraphine, yeah, that's an interesting... Uh, anyway, uh, and he said a lot of things he, uh, that were true, like general welfare and Madison, and Madison speaking that, no, general welfare does not mean individual welfare or corporate welfare or welfare for, you know, special group. I, I can show you, we have an article up on Davy Crockett was saying the same thing as when he was in Congress. And of course, he was only saying it because uh, one of his constituents, Horatio Bunce, had told him. But Horatio Bunce, who's he? He's just a farmer. But farmers back then knew way more than politicians know today about what America was like. You want to make America great again? You got to do what America was doing when it was on its road to becoming great. Tell you the truth, it's the same thing Rome was doing. Rome threw out, they had their uh, Revolutionary War, or Civil War, depending on how you want to put it. Revolution probably fit better. In 500 BC, they threw out the Tarquinian kings and they established a republic. And they established it along the same lines of an earlier republic, which I was just telling you how Aristotle had admired, and the Romans admired, which was Israel. Israel was a republic. People were free from things. Pub. That's what that's what the original word in the Latin libera res publica. That's where we get the word republic comes from. That Latin idiom that's translated free from things. Pub. And they, it was a big thing for Romans to donate money. I mean, the army was totally a militia army at the beginning. It wasn't until shortly before Christ that their army became more professional in nature, uh, where people would actually get salaries and pensions. Before that, it was a voluntary army. You would you would be helped out, but you were always tied back to your local community. And the Romans were organized in groups, small groups of 10, 12 families. And then they would pick somebody who would be their connection. And eventually you would get up to the Senate to what is literally an electoral college. But the Senate had no power to make law for everybody else. They weren't lawmakers. They were representatives. That's what we used to call congressmen, representatives. Sometimes we still do, but they also call themselves lawmakers now. Now they're regulating almost every aspect of your life. And that was one of the things your, uh, Peter pointed out. Regulate didn't mean rule over or make rules for. It meant help organize so that everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows when to show up. You know, it's like 
England back uh, uh, even before the longbow, they they would gather on the full moon. Full moon plays a big part in Israel's traditions, but it's not superstition. It's practical. You were supposed to meet when there was a full moon periodically. Well, one one reason why is you could look up and you say, well, it's going to be a full moon in five days. I got to get ready to go to the meeting because we're going to meet when there's a full moon. Well, why are you meeting on a full moon? Because there ain't no street lights. We got to walk home. We're going to stay up late talking. We want a full moon because that's our light at night. And they used to, the English used to meet for what they call the filling of the butts. And they would meet on the full moon for the filling of the butts. And it would be that guy there who's kind of the head guy of the meeting, he was called a tithing man because he was one in 10 men. They were still organizing that way in the 10 hundreds, 11 hundreds, 12 hundreds. Well, filling of the butts was target practice with a bow. They would shoot at a butt, which was a big bale of hay kind of thing. You know, they'd weave it together and it would become their target. When they had long bows, that they might put them out 200 yards and hit that in the middle of the night with moonlight. <laughs> so, but it was practical stuff. If if the altars of stone were not piles of rock where you burned up sheep, well, they had a they had a battle. One of the early days of Moses out there in the desert, Amalek's attack. Amalek's are the men who lick blood. It's a metaphor. There's a reason why they do. Uh, Moses talks about the cities of blood. There are cities of blood and there's cities that are not of blood. Well, he tells you how do you make a city of blood. You know, we be the, you know, we gather together like a cauldron and we be the flesh and they make these flesh pots. We have articles up on that, what he's talking about. But in their battle, men were injured. Men died. There were now widows amongst the Israelites. And so Moses, in order to solve this problem, he says, we're going to build an altar of Jehovah Nisi. And so what? how is that going to help anybody that we go to pile up stones and burn up sheep? How is that going to help anybody? How is that going to help the widows? How is that going to help the orphans? How is that going to help the men who are now wounded, maybe lost an arm or a leg in battle? They still got to make a living. Who's going to take care of them? Well, that's what the Levites were doing. That's what... That's what their priests were doing. They would tithe to them at the altar of Jehovah Nisi, and they would divide the resources that were given to them to help out the widows and or orphans of society. I told you at the beginning, there was only five times in the Bible where they mentioned the word religion, what we call religion today. Four of those times, they're talking about bad religion. They only talk about good religion one time. We know it's good religion because they call it pure religion. But what what's pure religion? Pure religion is how you take care of the needy of your society, the widows, orphans, sick, infirm, that need help. Normally, the family helps take care of them, but it if that's not enough, maybe they need help out. So you you go to church. The church in the wilderness was the Levites. You go to the ministers of Christ and they're going to help you out somehow. Well, how do they do it? I mean, the first thing they're doing after Pentecost is rightly dividing bread from house to house. Well, that's welfare. But it's a welfare funded by free will offering. If you have a welfare that's funded by forced offerings, like Sodom, which was one of those cities of blood, you weaken the poor. Now you just look in our own history, our recent history. Everybody's familiar with, well, not everybody. Everybody's not as old as I am. So my recent history goes back, you know, 70 plus years. But you look at the black community. Uh, I mean, I've heard it on the news. They know it's it's true. The turn of the century, 1900s, uh, single parent families were like less than 3% of the black community. Today, they're 60, 70% single parent family. And it's growing to that kind of numbers in the whites and even amongst the Orientals, Chinese, etc., who are at, many of them, you know, like the guys who came from Vietnam, you know, after the fall of Vietnam, they were they were successful within a few years in America because their families made them stronger. They worked to get the younger kids better education. They worked together to build a boat, to go fishing or to start a restaurant or whatever. And they were successful in almost no time because family made them stronger. Same thing with the black community after slavery. Black communities were, there were, certainly there was bigotry around, but there was huge areas of the country where there was very little bigotry. The bigotry actually has come and gone over a period of time. It got worse around 1910, 1912, 13. Different presidents brought in more segregation, etc. But what really has hurt the black community, I don't even like to call it black community. I don't see race uh, 
as an important thing, but the reality is it is part of history because we've created that social construct. But when LBJ targeted the black community with his great society, they went from being Republicans to Democrats. And you have this, I mean, I know lots of very successful people that are from the black community. Uh, you know, uh, was it Carlson who ran for president? who's a, a surgeon. He came from a single-parent family and uh, had a hard life. I mean, one of the, my favorite guy, Thomas Sowell, uh, both his parents died, and he was raised by other relatives. Grew up in Harlem. But that that guy, you know, they, he, he was a communist when he first came out of college. Even when he went in, he was a bit of a socialist. But he, he said, he was asked why he stopped being a communist. He said, facts, that... If you get free bread from the government, it's going to weaken you. It's going to weaken the social bonds of society. I mean, even bringing history into our modern times. Dr. Malone, who was discoverer, supposedly, of mRNA, uh, although he didn't produce this thing that's floating around as an mRNA vaccination, but he says that we live in a sick society, looking out there at how people use science to shut down the entire economy of the United States and all over the world. I mean, thousands upon thousands, probably millions of people have actually faced starvation because of that shutdown. People don't know because the news don't tell them. Well, we, we tell people we because we, we have people all over and we show you the, the effects of this and they're going to get worse. But I don't blame the government. This is what's different about me. A lot of people blame the government. They say, well, they have to go back to the Constitution or go back to this or go back to that. No, I blame the people because they lack knowledge of what Christ was really doing, what Moses was really doing. His altars of Jehovah Nisi was a welfare system where you knew your neighbors were looking out for you. All the Levite ministers were doing was regulating their free offering so that it was rightly divided where it was needed most. You know, I growing up, I was hearing, which if I was growing up, that's that's a long time ago, 60, 70 years ago, people were talking about welfare reform, uh, that you, you can't, you want to w reform welfare, we got to go back to charity. That was the complaint of that uh, fellow I mentioned that was scolding Davy Crockett. Government should not be in the charity business. That's our job. That's the people's job. If you want to be the government of the people, for the people, and by the people, you got to start doing what government is supposed to be doing, organizing yourselves. That's what, that's, there wouldn't have been any Minutemen if they weren't already doing. You know, when the Patrick Henry, uh, Patrick Henry was against the Constitution. Uh, Paul Revere, when he rode to warn the British, he actually got lost that night in the dark. Uh, was, must not have been a full moon. But uh, anyway, he got lost. and uh, But other guys made it through. But they were organized in the tens, hundreds, and thousands then. That's what. That's the way the early church was organized. They, you see it right out of the box. Paul's taking loads of grain to other churches and, and taking care of them. The early Christians were martyred because they wouldn't sign up for the welfare system of Rome. We have, their, we have the actual notes from the court cases that are still in, you know, as part of Roman history that shows that they said that you have to you have to sign up for our welfare. See, religion was how you take care of the needy of society. That's what it meant just 200 years ago. Now, that was what it meant 2,000 years. But let's look at a definition 200 years ago in America, maybe 200, well, 210 years ago in America. Religion was the pious performance of your duty to God and your fellow man. Now, of course, now, your atheist li listeners, which I welcome to listen. <laughs> uh, God don't need your money. He, he, he doesn't even need you singing songs to him. He can get any radio station he wants. I mean, he, he's probably got all kinds of singers that can sing better than me. Uh, th that's not limiting it very good because I'm not much of a singer. But uh, uh, he doesn't need your singing. What, what did he tell you to do? Moses told you. Jesus repeated it. John the Baptist said it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you tell me, is it loving your neighbor to take care of him when he's sick or injured or, you know, he, he maybe gets killed and his widow is left behind and his orphan children are left behind? 
Would that be loving him by taking care of those helping take care of them? Or would it be loving your neighbor to send men with guns to their house to make them donate to what you think everybody ought to have? Or you're going to take his house away? Yeah, that, that, we've accepted that. That that's the way you do it. That if you if you want to have a school down here on the corner, you got to tax your neighbor. You got to take away his labor, his sweat, his toil, what he's produced. You got to take it away so you can build your school. That's the, but it's it's for the children, they say. I have a school down the road. Of course, it's, it's quite a ways. The only active public school near here is 40 miles away. Uh you might find one to the north that's about 39 miles, but you got to go over the pass. But uh, there's a school just five miles away in Summer Lake, the town, which used to, we used to have more people living in my house than living in that town, so it's not a very big town. Uh, but they had a school there, and uh, uh, there was another school down the road a little bit farther, one of those one-room schoolhouses. Uh, I've got pictures of it on our uh, Schools as Tools Web, uh, web article will tell you about how they've used the schools to not teach you but to brainwash you for the last 100 years in America. And, and the study I show in that article is a government study that discovered this. It's, a, it's about, it's a part of the congressional record. But if they don't tell you, you're not going to know. And certainly you're not going to learn about that study in school because <laughs> so, they're not going to tell you what they've been up to for 100 years. They're not going to tell you. But it's all been uncovered and laid out. I kind of discovered it because we were home teaching our kids because schools were so far away. And so I became a collector of school books. Uh, the amount of books I have, most of them are in another room. We can't fit them all in this room. But uh, I was trying to find the best history books for my kids and uh, the best math books for my kids. And I'm looking at them. I'm looking at them from back in 1800s, 1920, 1930, 1940. 1950, 1960, and I'm saying, these are changing. They're different. 1945, fourth and fifth grade math book. I can get you high school graduates that can't solve those problems in the fifth grade math book from 1945. Uh, and, you know, what What kind of problems are they giving a fifth grader in 1945? Figure the volume of sand, gravel, and cement for pouring a sidewalk. I don't think any of your high school graduates could probably figure that out. <laughs> Certainly not the majority of them. That's not even at the end of the book. That's in the middle of the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, the a lot has changed. We don't understand the meaning of the words. People read the Bible, but they didn't change the Bible. Well, they have in some translation, but they changed the meaning of the words back to that religion where it talks about pure religion in James. And it's, what is pure religion? It's taking care of the needy, but unspotted by the world. Well, there's five different words in the New Testament they translate world, and none of them mean planet. The one that they have there, the definition right out of your concordance, you know, the biblical concordance. That world is constitutional order system of government. That's what that word. So you're taking care of the needy, of society if you're a Christian, not because of government handouts from your constitutional order or system of government, but from that, you know, very uh, basic thing we call charity. And of course, that's what John the Baptist was saying. Most people don't know it. Herod, King Herod, was sending out people to baptize people all over the Roman Empire into the kingdom of heaven. But his image of the kingdom of heaven wasn't the same as John the Baptist because he was promoting that Corbin of the Pharisee because that's what the Pharisees did. They said, you know, the, the temple wasn't full of gold in those days. Herod built pretty much what we see as the uh, temple at the time of Jesus Christ. And he did it by sending out missionaries all over the Roman Empire to baptize people into his system. When you got baptized into his system, you got a name, a Hebrew name. They would etch it either on clay or sometimes on stone. Most of the clay ones haven't survived, but there are a few of the stone ones that have survived. And every Hebrew letter has a numerical value, so this new Hebrew name was a number, and the scribes would write it down. You're now a member, but you're now going to be required to tithe. You have to pay it. There will be ministers from his government, Gabai. Molkai, ministers, that's the Hebrew word, will come out. They'll pace off your grain field. They'll count your fishes that you caught. They get a share. 
there's a little uh, cumin's plant that you can grow in your windowsill and it's a spice and you break off branches and put it in your your dinner and uh and jesus even jesus is actually a pretty funny guy he's making jokes all the time uh keeping the audience interested but most people don't know what he was talking about because they don't know the culture of that time but he says that they count the branches well that's because they get 20 percent of those branches because you're a member of their temple system, which was still organized tens, hundreds, and thousands. But that's where you're going to get your welfare. But that kind of welfare, Jesus complains about it, makes the word of God to none effect because it causes sons to do no more ought for their parents because they don't have to take care of their parents. Parents will be taken care of by the government temple that is funded by forced offering. Along comes John the Baptist. He didn't go to the laver to get people baptized at the temple. His father used to be the high priest, but he was murdered. He goes he goes out to the Jordan River and he baptizes people. And he, he's organizing people also in the tens, hundreds, and thousands. But they ask him, how does the kingdom of God work? So here's your answer on kingdom of heaven for all the atheists. Well, the kingdom of heaven doesn't work by force. It works by free will offering. So he says, if you have two coats and your neighbor doesn't have a coat, share. But he's empowering you to make the choice what to share, what not to share, what to remit, what not to remit, what to give, what not to give. But he's putting the responsibility back on the people to love their neighbor as themselves. Today, people get attacked in the streets you know, I remember you could, you know, I could walk through, you know, Baltimore, uh, Boston, uh, Washington, D.C., you know, 60 years ago. I mean, Thomas Soul talks about, it. you know, you'd sleep out on your balcony, you know, out on the fire escape on a hot day in New York. You could sleep in the park. Nobody was worried about getting shot or robbed or stabbed. Well, we hadn't had 50 years of welfare. Uh, you go back to 150 years before Christ, historian. Polybius, who uh, was originally from Corinth, but he was actually kind of held as a hostage by the Roman government. Uh, and it was a good thing for him because eventually the Roman government went and destroyed Corinth, took down all the buildings, killed all the men and sold all the women and children into slavery. There was no more Corinth for like 50 years. It was just empty, gone. And uh, But uh, he was still in Rome, well-respected, brilliant man, brilliant author, historian. And he says that with an appetite for benefit, the masses with an appetite for benefits become accustomed to living at the expense of others and depending for their livelihood on the property of others, they will degenerate. They will institute the rule of force and violence to get what they want, which is what everybody's done with socialism. Socialism is about forcing country, which dissolves those social bonds of a free society which Malone was saying, we need to restore. He said, we live in a sick society. We need to reestablish the social bonds of society. I have an article up, Social Bonds. Talks about what he said, talks about what it says in the Bible from the beginning. I mean, this idea of going to rulers to get benefits. Jesus said, you're not to be like the governments of the Gentiles who call themselves benefact, but exercise authority. In other words, force the offerings of the people. If you're going to follow Christ, that's what you got to do. Now, I understand that there's a lot of people on welfare, disability, social security. I'm not telling you to jump off those systems or even destroy those systems. Have some sort of violent revolution. That would be ridiculous. She'd get nothing but more misery out of that. What I'm saying is think differently. That's what the word repent means. It means to think differently and start gathering together with one another, seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, seeking to learn how to love your neighbor as yourself, take care of one another. We have to revitalize charity in America because we didn't have people starving in the streets for a century or more. Uh, we we had the greatest growth and uh, success in society we're able to, uh, I think we did it in the wrong way, but eventually we freed the slaves. But now, because we did it with violence, uh, you could have bought the slaves for less than you spent on the war. You could have bought all the slaves and just freed for, for the amount of money that you spent on the Civil War. And, and the amount of money, and definitely, maybe three times on the amount of money it cost because of the destruction of property. You know, I mean, the the slash and burn of Sherman's army through the South and all this kind of stuff uh, that wasn't productive by any means whatsoever. It would have been cheaper for everybody if we just bought all the slaves 
and set them free. You know, and I would like to add one more thing about that. It even sure. preserve a lot more lives as well. Most very important. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the cost of lives, uh, white and black, that died in that war. Uh, the same thing was going on in England. England, you know, was trying to stop the. You know, the fact is, you follow the money. You know, we we can talk some other time about the money changers. What that was all about. We have an article up on that explains who were the money changers and why was it significant that Jesus was there and what was that string whip doing there? I mean, we've seen pharaohs holding a string whip in their hand and a crook. We got images of that all over the world. Jesus made a string whip and went around. All he was doing, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. He was firing the porters of the temple. And who could do that? Well, since the days of King David, the king, only the king could fire the porters of the temple. Well, the high priest could, but that that gets us into the high priest was corrupt at that time. They hadn't had an honest high priest probably since Simon the Just back in the days of Alexander the Great. But that's another. We got an article up on that. Lots of articles. We keep people reading forever. Lots of audios. Um, but I'm I'm throwing out a lot of teasers, jumping around real quick. But that's what religion is. Religion isn't singing in church. Worship worship is a word that means service. Well, like I said, God don't need your money. He doesn't need you to make something for him. You know, like you're gonna I'm gonna make some furniture for for God. <laughs> he doesn't need that. He wants you to love his creation. He wants you to dress it and keep it. He wants you to tend to the land and tend to the people that are on it. Uh, even, he wants you to even love your enemy. You know, if, and this is something I've said recently in bringing history, it, there's no point in studying history unless you're going to apply what you learn to the present day. People say, if you don't study history, you're condemned to repeat it. Well, that's that's a scary thought because we've got a lot of war and death and mayhem in our history. And so if we don't know how we got to those things, well, Let's take a look at what's going on in the Middle East now. You know, Hamas, they do bad things. And uh, uh, people who like to see bad things done promoted Hamas. Uh, they may do good things. I don't know. I don't, I don't know anybody who's in Hamas. But I can tell you this. If all the people in Gaza, all the Muslims of the world were doing what Abraham was doing, and all the Jews today, and there's a variety of them all over from New York, Hasidics to Israel, Zionists. I mean, so, I mean, even the word Jew, what does it even mean? Because there's so many different people out there. And there's going to be good and bad in all these groups. There's going to get good Muslims and there's going to be... I know of Muslims that give you the shirt off their back. They'd risk their life to save you. Uh, I, I know Jews that would do the same. I know people in some of those groups will also kill you, slit your throat. It's just, there's good and bad everywhere. And that's the only division we should make. It's not about race. It's not about ethnic religions or anything like that. It's about what you do. And But if all the Arab, uh, I won't say Arabs, all the Muslims were doing what Abraham did, and they claimed to be following Abraham, and all the Jews were doing what Moses said to do, and all the Christians were doing what Christ said to do, there wouldn't be any battle going on in the Middle East. Uh, and that's just because Abraham... Moses, Jesus Christ. What did Moses, Abraham set up altars too. He set up altars out there. He, he, he was in Ur. There's a whole story to that. It's not in the biblical text, but there's, there's definitely a story there. And then he went to Haran. His father started Haran Terah. And then he left the home of his nativity. He would have been king in Haran because uh, he was the eldest son. But he left that. Came this Hebrew wanderer out there in the desert, which was somewhat precarious. He, he he went back several times, but eventually he came out with, it says, many souls. And they go around teaching people to build altars to Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever, to God. So they're piling up stones and killing sheep and setting them on fire. And this is bringing all the people together somehow so that when an army comes and defeats one city state after another and conquers Sodom and takes all their gold and silver and a lot of their people captive to be slaves in their own country and they're going back, Abraham says, I'm going to go stop them. And all the people round about him said, we're going to we're going to go with you, Abraham. They're going to leave their houses, leave their work, attack an army who seemed to be invincible, and, and run at these guys with sharp things. And those guys got sharp things. How did burning up sheep make them so loyal to Abraham? Because 
That's not what they were doing with the altar. Same word in the Hebrew for a gathering of friends is the same word of a gathering of stones. It's metaphors. It's full of metaphor. You know, you're, you're supposed to give the Levite the kidneys. That's their share of the sacrifice. Well, that means that if I'm a Levite, I'm going to have kidney pie for breakfast and kidney roasted kidney for lunch and kidney fat for supper because that's my share? No. The same word for kidney is reins of control. You the sacrifice you're giving, you're giving him control. You get to pick him. You get to say, Joe's, he's solid as a rock. He's going to be the stone of my altar. And I know there was a lot of people hurt in this battle. We'll take it back to that, that battle with the Amaleks. You know, I want to make sure everybody gets enough to eat. I want to make sure those widows are taken care of. I want to make sure those orphans don't go hungry. So I'm going to give to my Levite minister the stone of my altar. I'm going to lay this sacrifice on burnt offering. It's a burnt offering. That means I give it up entirely. I'm not going to say you can only give it to white folks. <laughs> or you can only give it to black folks. Or you can only give it to people on my block. I'm going to give it to you completely freely given, voluntarily given, and you decide where best to give it. Now, I can keep an eye on you and say, like, did he help anybody? Because you can't keep a secret in a community of tens, hundreds, and thousands. So everybody's going to know who's doing a good job and who's not doing a good job. If you're not doing a good job, pick another guy to give to. But give, you must. Otherwise, you won't create the social bonds of society. That's why people get raped in the streets. People get robbed and people close their shades and nobody hue and cry in America. Somebody murder somebody. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, everybody would turn out to find the criminal. I mean, you read the old stories, Jane Eyre, whatever, these different books, somebody gets robbed, um, everybody turns out. Silas Marner, he got robbed, everybody turns out to help find it and everybody wants to make sure that he's taken care of well it was restore that sense of um community that's why isolation loneliness pressure oh, yeah. anxiety all that's through the roof i mean i i completely agree well not only that but if you're not spending part of your day thinking about somebody other than you somebody else's problems other than you you will be depressed i mean it's, you go ask psychologists i mean yeah. i've heard yeah. just recently jordan peterson talking about it. You have to, men have to have a purpose in life. Women have to have the feeling that they've cared for somebody in life. But you say, well, no, it's the government's job. I'm just going to, I'm going to go sit in my pew and think good thoughts about my neighbor. I'm not going to actually do anything for him. I mean, in the early church for, for centuries, 100% of all welfare was taken care of by the people. They wouldn't eat at the altars of the pagan temples. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a like, subscribe. Even donate one time or subscribe as a $3 a month fee if you choose to do so, regardless of your choice. I really do hope you have a blessed day, afternoon, or night.